This conference will now be recorded. I'll wait a few more minutes, um, probably about five more minutes before uh, I start. All right, I'll go ahead and uh, get started now. Um, hi everybody, I'm Paul Brooks. Um, I've had my bio up on the screen here for about, oh, an hour or so, maybe a little under an hour. Um, has all my information on there. A um, Couple of things I wanna go over before we actually get in and get started. Um, I included a Dropbox link um, both in the chat and also as your entrance message. And um, that also includes uh, my uh, email address in it. Um, the Dropbox link has the entire PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to be doing tonight with all of the hyperlinks that are in it. Instead of just trying to share a whole bunch of hyperlinks during the presentation, it'll probably be easier just to download the entire entire PowerPoint presentation, and then use the hyperlinks that are on the presentation itself. Um, give a quick overview of the bio. Um, I'm married. I'm dad, three kids, uh, based out of Muscatine. A um, little bit of history about me. I was born in Des Moines. Uh, in the northern suburbs of Des Moines, and then uh, moved to Texas when I was 10. Um, as far as storms are concerned, probably my biggest influence and the thing that got me into storms more than anything else was witnessing what I witnessed while I was down in Texas. Um, 
multiple different tornadoes, multiple different locations. Um, and like my bio says, I was very, very close to the DeSoto Lancaster tornado down there in 1994. Um, I actually saw it go about a quarter of a mile behind my house when it was first forming and then helped clean up afterwards. It was a completely devastating tornado that flattened about four and a half miles of houses up in uh, Lancaster. Um, at age 15, uh, me and my family relocated to the Western Illinois area. Some of you might be familiar with the Alpha Woodhull area. Um, we relocated there. Uh, while I was going to high school, I was again exposed to an absolutely beautiful storm. Um, many of you that know the area and have been around for a while, um, that was the 90, 1994 Galva tornado. And I was running at a track meet when that tornado touched down and I watched it come into Galva. My parents and my coach had to pull me back inside of the building because I was so enthralled with what I saw. Um, as far as chasing storms go, I started doing that in early 2006, officially. I, I say officially. Um, I had been out a couple of different times with other people, but I'd never been on my out on my own. Um, my first official chase was in 2006. Started out in a four county area around Muscatine. Um, in 2011, I started chasing a little bit further, encompassing the northern half of Illinois, um, a little bit of southern Wisconsin, northern Missouri, and almost all of Iowa. Um, in 2013, I took a few trips into Southern Minnesota and far Eastern Nebraska. And starting in 2015, I started chasing basically the entire um, Midwest, uh, mostly upper Midwest, but occasionally a little further South. Um, in 2007, I also witnessed the Grandview Muscatine tornado, which quite a few of you are probably familiar with that one. Um, started down in Grandview, came down the bluff, went through Muscatine, and lifted just on the north side of town. Um, the building that I was in at the time uh, was about 200 yards from where the damage path went. A very interesting storm as far as storms go. Um, I'm degreed in computer sciences uh, through from MCC. Uh, emphasis on uh, computer networking. And I also took a few meteorology classes while I was going to school there as electives. Um, when I'm out chasing, I also do uh, immediate first aid and occasionally deal with injuries. Um, I'm a first responder, but I haven't updated in about three years, so I probably need to do that again. Um, photography wise, I started around the age of 10, simple film point and shoot, um, moving up slowly, transitioning fully to digital. In um, I run still cameras, video cameras, and I capture pretty much events. Uh, some of the stuff that I've taken photos of, bands, Aurora Borealis, the night sky, but by far my favorite to capture is lightning. Love analyzing data. Uh, for anybody that's actually followed me on Facebook, you know that I like putting out uh, warnings when the northern lights are going to appear. I run a, a model on my computer here at home to try to help predict when that's going to happen. Uh, before we go any further, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to type them into the chat. Um, I'm going to stop about every two to three slides, try to answer some of those, and then I will also have a question and answer session at the end. Um, anything that I don't get to and you would still like to be addressed, um, we can actually send an email to me. Uh, I provided that in the message here, and I will also have it up at the end of the slideshow.
All right, a couple of things I'm going to cover today. Um, this is obviously a session about storm photography. Um, first thing that I'm going to cover, and this is going to be pretty in depth, is storm safety. Um, I'll also be covering some camera settings, um, some protection for cameras, and suggested glass. Um, I'm not going to go too in depth with editing. I'll have a couple of tips, pointers, and hyperlinks later on, but everybody's editing style is different, so I kind of leave that one alone and let you choose your own path as far as editing is concerned. Um, like I said before, if you have any questions, please use the chat box, and I'll try to stop every few slides to answer some of those. Knowing storms and their movement. Uh, the key to a successful storm photo session before all else is learning what the weather does and what it is doing in real time. That includes how storms tend to move, what types of storms are good for photographing and what type of photography is good for each storm and having the ability to follow the weather using apps and websites for mobile devices. The first thing that I recommend to everybody before they even attempt any type of storm photography is to take the spotter training class from the National Weather Service in the Quad Cities. Normally, this would be done in an in-class session um, in person. This year, they have actually done, gone to a fully uh, automated presentation like what I'm doing with you guys. Um, and they also made a link available to everybody in the general public so that they can kind of get an idea of what spotting is. I have included it in the slideshow that's here, this blue hyperlink. I highly recommend that you watch that. It's about two hours long, but it is well worth the read. Um, that session is extremely in-depth for somebody that hasn't followed weather and even those of us that do follow weather on a regular basis they come up with a couple of new things just about every year if not every other year um, this is a great resource to uh, for learning storm movements storm structure and some identification tricks it is essential to learn this before attempting to capture photos of a storm away from the safety of your own home Lightning safety, and this is a big one. Always photograph lightning from a secure structure. Um, there are two different types of secure structures that I recommend. Number one would be from your home. You got a roof over your head. You have walls to protect you. You can sit in the garage, take photos out of your garage and not put yourself in any danger. Um, the other option, is a Faraday cage, which would be a vehicle with good grounding. Um, vehicles are made to withstand lightning strikes. Yes, you may melt the tires if you get struck, but they are a safe area for lightning. Whatever you do, do not take, do not stand outside to take photos. If you need to photograph from the outside of a vehicle or your house, put the camera outside and use a remote of some sort, intervalometer, wireless, wired with a lock switch, any of them will work. Um, lightning can and does travel up to 20 miles away from the storms. Um, be aware of all storms in the area, not just the one that you're looking at or trying to get photos of, but also the ones that might be behind you. It's essential that you keep an eye all the way around because sometimes the storm can surprise you. I'm gonna go ahead and roll this video. Um, it's a shortened clip and it's from my buddy, Danny Murphy. Um, this happened, I believe in 2012 or 2013 um, in Northern Iowa up by Denison. Danny had been chasing for about 14 years um, before this video was taken, knew his lightning safety in and out. And the one time that he got out of his vehicle to film, this happened. Thank you. 
What you see there is a lightning strike that was not a direct strike. It hit about 20 yards, maybe 30 yards in front of him, arced up to a power line that was next to the road, and then transferred from that power line down to him. He was in the hospital for about four and a half weeks after this lightning strike, and still to this day has uh, medical issues because of this lightning strike. I bring up lightning safety because you really can't ever predict where lightning is going to happen. So you need to keep that safe radius of 20 miles away from a storm if you can at all possible. If there's a storm within 20 miles, you don't get out of your vehicle and you do not leave the house. Okay, first area I'm going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Laura asked a question. Is there a way to ground the tripod if it is outside of the vehicle so the camera doesn't get bright? The answer to that would be no, there is not. A tripod is naturally ground um, by itself, but the electrical power from a lightning bolt, no matter what, will fry a camera if it is struck. Um, one of those things, I highly recommend you get insurance. That way you're covered. In case of that, uh, my insurance actually does cover that fully. Uh, it's one of the things that I made sure of when I purchased the insurance policy for my gear. Um, but yeah, there is no way to make sure that your camera does not get fried. Doesn't look like I have any other questions right now, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. In our area, storms tend to move northwest, southeast, southwest to northeast, and west to east. Each movement direction will have different results as far as speed of the storm and the ease of photographing the storm. Um, these are just general storm movements. No storm is ever going to move due northwest to due southeast or due southwest to due northeast. It's general movements. They tend to move in that general, these three general directions um, as they come through our area. First one is Northwest to Southeast moving storms. Um, these storms in our area generally tend to produce large, fast moving shelf clouds, kind of what you see in the photo back behind there. Um, these storms normally give you about 30 to 40 minutes of setup time and only allow usually for a single set of photos. They tend to move between 45 and 70 miles an hour and can produce dangerous winds, which is the 50 to 110 mile an hour range. Um, what I do when I'm photographing these storms normally is I set up for a vertical panorama, which means I put the camera in portrait mode and I take about eight, 15 shots of the shelf cloud as it gets about four to five miles away. That gives you a little bit of scale of the size of the cloud. It gives you a very wide field of view, sometimes up to uh, about 270 degrees. And it tends to make the flattest um, panoramic that you can make. Um, generally with these, that's the only type of photography that I even attempt with them. You can try to stick it out for the underside of the shelf cloud, which is called the whale's mouth, but you're putting yourself at risk for getting blasted by a whole bunch of wind, a little bit of hail, and some very high winds. So I pick and choose which one of those I try to get. It's one of those things, once you have a little bit of more experience, something you can attempt. Second type of storm movement. The second direction that storms move in our area is southwest to northeast. These storms have the cap capability of producing all three types of severe weather, wind, hail, and tornadoes. These cells generally move at between 25 to 60 miles an hour. These cells do change directions and often become west-east oriented. Um, at least the front side of the cell does, and there's very little warning when that happens. Visually, these cells can produce 
any of the three photos that you see here, um, a general thunderstorm all the way up to layered shelf clouds on the front side of a storm like this and prolific lightning. These storms also produce supercells. Um, the supercells are the generally the only type of um, storm in our area that can produce tornadoes. Occasionally, there are a couple of other ones that I will cover a little bit later on, but generally the uh, southwest and northeast moving storms are the only ones that produce tornadoes. We saw this last week. It was a little bit more of a north-northeast movement with the uh, storms instead of directly northeast, but the storms that came through last week that produced the tornadoes in central Iowa, northern Iowa, and over by Cambridge were all this type of a cell. The third general movement that we get in our area with storms is west to east moving cells. These cells tend to produce giant shelf clouds. Uh, these would be the shelf clouds that go from one end of your field of view all the way to the other. Um, they produce very high winds and can also produce QLCS tornadoes and regular tornadoes. Uh, QLCS is quasi-linear convective system. That just means it's a very, very large complex of storms. Um, QLCS tornadoes are almost exclusively embedded in rain and cannot be photographed easily. I do not recommend trying to get photos of this type of tornado because you're putting yourself in a whole bunch of danger if you do so. Um, these storms are I would say 99% of the time they're linear. Um, that means large complex of storms in a Boeing section or a backwards C shape. If you look at a radar, they will be in a backwards C um, moving west to east. Um, the regular tornadoes that do form on these types of storms are normally on the southern tip of the line. We don't generally see them in our area but we do occasionally get one down on the Iowa-Missouri border, that general area where they do produce a regular tornado. These cells also tend to produce vivid lightning um, if you're out at night and they are best to photograph from behind the line, not in front of it. Um, the reason I say that the back side of these cells, especially if it's close to sunset, they produce really vibrant cloud colors. I'm going to pause and answer a question. Uh, Dixie is asking about the lens. Um, I'm going to be covering that in an upcoming uh, slide, so I'm going to hold off on answering that. Um, and like I said, you can download this whole PowerPoint presentation so that I have that you guys all have links to it. Um, all the links that I've included so far, and a whole bunch more that are coming up. There's no other questions. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next section. All right. Storm chasing. Uh, this is leaving your house or your normal place of residence to pursue storms. Um, I do not recommend doing this and the National Weather Service does not recommend doing this either unless you have five plus years of spotting experience. That generally means you're very experienced with how the storms in our area move, even the weird movements, or you have five chases with an experienced chaser, somebody like myself. Um, there's a couple other people I'll be bringing up later on in the presentation, they're experienced chasers. We have about 40 experienced chasers in our area. And I highly recommend that you go out with at least two or three of them if you can get a hold of them um, to go on a chase. Don't go out and do it on your own. It's not very safe unless you really know what you're doing. Um, when you do go out chasing, it's always best to have one other person with you. The reason for that is that you need another set of eyes. You can't look ahead of you and behind you at the same time. And a lot of the times with the storms in our area, 
you'll be looking at a cell that's out in front of you and something will sneak up on you from the back end. So it's always best to chase with the second person. When I go out, I almost always have my son with me. And if not, I have about four or five other chase partners that I can ask. Uh, this year, that won't be happening because of our situation, but I do have my son that will go out with me most of the time this year. Uh, when you're out chasing storms, always be prepared for the unexpected and have a plan in place for some of those unexpected situations. What I'm talking about there, uh, I covered it kind of earlier in one of the slides. The tornadic storms have a whole bunch of different features that can cause the storm to go from, say, southwest to northeast moving. And then all of a sudden it'll adjust and take a, what we call a right hand turn where it will go due west. You need to have roads that are in good condition and you need to have at least two or three different uh, driving direction options as far as the road is concerned. So you need to have an escape route in case it does something that you're not planning. Next section that I'm going to cover is apps and websites um, for phones. 99% of the people that go out and pursue storms, and even those that don't, um, they have a whole bunch of apps and websites that they use to keep track of what's going on weather-wise. Um, the first one that I'm going to cover is the National Weather Service mobile website. Um, I have a link on here. Like I said, download this and you'll be able to hit that link. Um, all you have to do on that website, pull it up. It's mobile.weather.gov. And then it'll ask for your location. You can either use your zip code or a city name, and it will pull up all the information that you could possibly want. Um, very, very recent development. It's only been out for about a year, but it's a very good product. Um, the biggest one that I recommend, especially if you're going to be out chasing storms, would be Radar Scope. Um, that's what's right here in the right hand side and top. Um, Radar Scope is a specialized display utility for weather enthusiasts and meteorologists that allows you to view all of the super resolution products from, directly from National Weather Service radar sites. It also includes all warnings, um, including marine warnings. If you do happen to go down to Florida or something like that, it includes every warning that they possibly put out. Um, it is the best option for analyzing a storm for those of you that are used to radar um, data. It allows you to look at the entire section of the storm and analyze what's going on. Um, the data for this app uh, is downloaded within seconds of when the radar takes it. Um, this is a paid app and you can use it on both Android and Apple. Um, the baseline version is $9.99 a year and they have tiered levels going up from there that include even more data the higher up you go. I think the most expensive one is like $39.99 a year and it includes every product that they could possibly have out. Third, web, third one is a website. Um, it's called lightningmaps.org. It is a real-time lightning strike monitoring webpage. What it does is it takes data from the entire US lightning strike system, which it, it goes all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast, and they actually have started a worldwide network as well. Um, it takes all the data from I believe it's 450 different points in the US. They have lightning strike sensors, takes that data, triangulates from using towers, triangulates where the lightning hit down to within about an eighth of a mile of where the actual lightning strike occurred. Um, very useful if you're trying to get pictures of lightning at night. Um, it does help during the day, but daytime, it's a little bit different than nighttime. We'll cover that a little bit later. Um, the fourth one that I recommend is the KWQC weather app. Um, 
pretty much any of the weather station or any of the news stations weather apps are good for general overviews of what's going on with the storm they're not real detailed they don't have real-time lightning data but they do have really good warning boxes and warning systems with them um, so that's really good with them and they also have some really good overlays in some of those including um, your clouds which could be useful for both storm and astrophotography. Um, they also cover a little bit of the more in-depth um, warnings. They'll pull up text boxes so that you can read out the entire warning. And they also offer long-term forecast, which some of them are good, some of them are not. I'll let you decide that on your own. Um, the last one on here is for PC only. It is called GR Products. Um, the website is grlevelx.com. They have, I believe it's five different products right now, but the one that I recommend is GR Level 3 Revision 2. It is $80 and it is $80 per year. Um, this is the most in-depth weather software that there is on the earth right now, and it is what the National Weather Use Service uses in their office to analyze the storms along with a couple other pieces of software. Um, it actually lets you take digital uh, images of a storm using the radar, which is really cool. You can turn the storm so that instead of looking at a flat version like what you see behind here, it takes you and lets you look at it from the side so you can actually analyze how the clouds are as far as directions that they're moving, directions that they're building. It's very in-depth and it's not something that I recommend for a new user. It's It took me almost 10 years before I actually even looked at that software and really I don't use it a whole bunch. I still have it, but I don't use it a whole bunch. So. look to see if there's any questions doesn't look like there is so i'm going to go ahead and move on to the next section next section i'm going to cover is camera protection many people do not have completely weather sealed cameras and even those of us that do it's a good idea to protect your camera when you're going out for photos of storms what i recommend is a rain sleeve you could technically make one on your own using a general plastic bag from just about any grocery store, but it's not going to protect like some of the products that I have listed here. Um, one of them is the Lenscoat brand. Lenscoat is a see-through um, sleeve. Uh, you can see the entire lens, the entire camera, and the back of the camera. It has little arm sections that you put your hands into. Um, generally runs anywhere between $30 to $40, and they protect the cameras pretty well. The only downfall to those is that they are just regular double insulated plastic, um, which doesn't hold up well over time, or if you expose it to, say, really hot and then really cold conditions, it tends to rip and tear over the course of about a year. So it's about a yearly replacement on those. Um, the other one that I have listed here is called Vortex brand or Vortex media brand. Um, they are specific almost exclusively to storm chasers. And it is a PVC, pliable PVC sleeve that slides over the camera and the lens. They guarantee their product to stand up to 95 mile an hour wind driven rain. It is a very good sleeve, but it is also extremely expensive. Um, their cheapest one starts at about $112, um, but you get what you pay for. It lasts a long time. Um, another option is Aquatech, which is what you see on the screen here. Um, not the best choice as far as being able to see what you're doing with your lens. Um, it does have a viewfinder area in the back that you can look at that, but as far as adjusting, say, focus or anything like that, this one isn't really good. The Aquatech is really, really good um, with these 
little sections and I'm gonna pull up the pointer so I can point them out. These little sections right here are all drawstrings, which allows you to tighten even tighter the sections around the camera so that no water can get inside. The Aquatec sleeve does keep almost every drop of rain out of the camera itself and keeps about 98% of the water out of the lens, except for the front element. Um, very good sleeve, but like I said, with the other ones, you get what you pay for. This is a mid-range, it starts at about $60. Um, the last option that you have, and the camera corner does have, these are the Optech um, sleeves. They are double insulated uh, sleeve, kind of like the lens coat is, but the Optech are even cheaper made than the lens coat brands are. They will hold up to maybe about three to four uses before they start to rip and tear, but they are extremely cheap and easy to replace. If I were going to recommend one for somebody just getting into it, that would be the one that I recommend. It starts out at, I think the last time I checked, it was $19.99 for a sleeve up at the camera corner. So you could probably contact them about that. Another essential thing for camera protection when you're out doing storm photography is to carry something with you to dry your lens. I usually have one or two different options with me. I'm gonna show you one of the ones that I tend to carry with me. It's this piece right here. It's a giant terry cloth. It allows me to wipe down multiple different times the front element of the lens if it gets rain on it doesn't matter if I'm doing photography or videography, you got to keep that front element clean. Otherwise, you're not going to have a good, clear photo or video. Um, the other option that I carry with me is one of the small pocket size lens dryers or lens cloths. Um, and I also carry one of the uh, circular lens dabbers so that if I do get a rain spot that doesn't want to come off and it's being a pain in the butt, just take that and clean it off. I'm going to pause real quick. What about underwater cameras such as the Tough 6 or Tough 7? Underwater cameras stand up to water really, really, really well. They are not a foolproof option, um, but most of them for storms will work very well. The problem that you run into with underwater cameras is they do have some one and sometimes two extra layers of plastic in front of the front element. That can distort um, your photos. It can add some really weird lines to your photos. And it can also, when you're shooting lightning, add some what are called atmospheric distortions that are unfixable. Um, when I, when I say that, lightning generally tends to produce a halo around itself no matter what you're shooting with. And if you have plastic in front of that glass, it tends to reflect first and foremost. And secondly, it tends to diffract. And what happens when a, a lightning bolt diffracts inside of plastic is you get almost a complete white out of the exposure. So you're not actually capturing anything even if you had all of your settings exactly right. Um, they do have uses for daytime um, storm photography if you are in heavy rain, because the water just runs right off of them. So the water's not in front of the lens for very long, but that would be about the only thing that I would use them for. Um, if you're doing video, there are a couple of other similar underwater um, uh, type of enclosures that you can get for video cameras, small handy cam type deals. Um, but that's generally only for video and not for photos. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next one. gear and here's where i'm going to start getting into the cameras lenses and that kind of stuff for dixie who was asking about it earlier first thing i'm going to cover is camera capabilities 
Um, you'll want a camera with a wide array of exposure settings. Um, basically, you want to be able to control your exposure anywhere from one eight thousandth of a second all the way up to 30 second exposures. Most mid-level DSLRs and mirrorless cameras perform these easily, as do a few bridge cameras. Um, some of the newer bridge cameras have actually gotten really good about their manual controls and their manual focus. So those are a viable option as well. Um, the lenses that you use with these cameras need to be able to use split filters for foreground sky light balance and variable ND filters for daytime lightning and also for super high contrast scenes. Um, the type doesn't really make much of a difference, mounted squares, rectangles, or circular screw-in type, but the more, more money that you spend on a filter, generally the better it tends to perform. I found this out the hard way. You don't wanna buy one of those cheap plastic kits that you see on eBay or Amazon. They do not work well at all. Um, what you generally want if you're going to be using uh, filters is something that goes directly up against your front element or right next to your front element or a screw in. That way you're not allowing any light leak in behind it. Um, the third thing that I recommend is remote triggering. Don't care how you remote trigger, but remote triggering is essential in storm photography. You're dealing with dynamic movement of the storm, dynamic range in your light, and sometimes even trying to take photos on the move. The only way that you're going to be able to take a photo without introducing a whole bunch of shake to it is by using a remote trigger on a tripod. Um, I found that out early, early on. I would say the first three years that I chased, I tried to shoot handheld most of the time. It doesn't work very well. You get okay photos, but they're not as sharp as some of the ones that you've seen, even in this slideshow. Um, you tend to get blur around the edges. You tend to get blur sometimes in the foreground and occasionally even up in the sky. It's not good. I really recommend getting a trigger or an intervalometer. Some of the newer cameras do have intervalometers built into them. If they do have that on the cameras that you have, please look into how those work on your camera and use them. They are a invaluable tool, um, especially if you wanna do time-lapse photography, but even just taking general photos of a storm without introducing shake, that's one of the best ways to do it. You can set it up, most of them, anywhere from like five up to a thousand exposures at a time. Um, the fourth thing that I recommend is a full manual or assisted manual control on the camera. That would be M mode, uh, shutter priority or aperture priority. Um, I would say 99% of the time that's the mode that I'm in when I'm out taking photos of storms. It's pretty necessary to have full control of your settings just because of the dynamic ranges that you're going to be running into. Um, the very last thing that I recommend is a camera that can take raw file photos. This makes the post-processing of the photos a million times easier. Um, like I said, very high dynamic range on a lot of the photos that you're dealing with. And it's a lot easier to correct them if you have a good raw file to work with. A JPEG won't allow you near what you need to get the detail that you need out of the highlights. That means taking the highlights down and then a lot of the times you'll pull the shadows up in a lot of these shots because to get the median exposure of the storm, you usually have at least one section in the upper section that's blown out and one in the lower section that's slightly underexposed. So having that raw file makes it a lot easier to change that. Dixie, this part is what you were asking about. These are very specific lens uh, recommendations that I have. Um, I shoot wide angle. I would say for about 90%, maybe a little bit less than 
between 85 and 90 percent of my storm photography. Um, the rest of them, it is, I would say, probably two percent mid range, which would be your regular uh, kit lenses, that general range. And then the rest of it after that is all super zoom. Um, and that's more for tornadic storms so that I can get detailed photos of a tornado. I'll cover that here in a little bit though. 15 millimeters on a full frame is the widest angle that you can possibly use. Occasionally with some of the larger full frames that have come out recently, you can go all the way down to 14, but it's generally accepted that 15 millimeters is the widest angle. Um, that you can use for a lens. For crop sensors and micro four-thirds cameras, it will be wider, uh, usually 10 millimeters for a crop sensor, maybe eight millimeters if you get real lucky, um, and four to six millimeters on a micro four-thirds camera. Um, for larger formats, it can be anywhere from 15 to 24 millimeters. Um, some of your medium format cameras, don't go any lower than 24 millimeters because that is the equivalent to a 15 millimeter full frame camera. Um, and if anybody in here is shooting a medium format while they're out taking photos of storms, I have got to see some of your photos when you get them because I have never had the chance to use medium format out in the field. So I'm kind of interested to see what they look like. Um, I've used medium format for portraits, but I've never used it for storms. I'm too scared to take that expensive of equipment out into the rain with me. Um, some specific lenses that I recommend. Um, the first one is the Tokena 11-16 to 2.8. Um, this is for crop sensors and some full frame cameras. I actually use this lens with my a Sony a7R4 um, and an adapter for the A mount. Um, I would say 80% of what you have seen in the slideshow so far was taken with that lens. It is a very versatile lens. Um, and I've used it on, I think, three different camera bodies now, including the one that I own. Um, had that lens, I think, for about six years now. Second one I recommend is the Tamron 10-24. Uh, this is for crop sensor cameras and a very few full frame cameras. Um, it can be used with uh, the Sony line. Um, as far as I know, everything else, Canon, and Nikon, and uh, Mayama, they all do not accept this lens because it is a crop lens. Um, Sony has the technology in their cameras that you can change it over to crop mode and it will adapt to that lens. So um, I have this lens in my bag and it's actually the one that my son use, uses most of the time now. Um, it is a 3.5 to 5.6 uh, aperture. And I would say everything that I took photos of from say 2012 until 2016 was shot with that lens. Some of the shots that that lens has seen um, that you guys might be familiar with would be the uh, bridge lightning photos that I've taken here in Muscatine um, from about seven years ago. Um, let's see, I think I did the lunar eclipse photo that pretty much everyone has seen. Did that back in 2016 with that lens. Um, it's a very versatile lens and it lasts a really long time. I've had that lens for over 12 years now and it is extremely reliable um, and has yet to mess up on me, knock on wood. Um, for micro four thirds, um, I got this recommendation from a friend of mine who shoots micro four thirds. His name's Mark. Um, I recommend the Olympus 7 to 14 2.8 Pro. Um, this lens is extremely sharp from edge to edge and does a really, really good job with lightning photos. I've seen some of Mark's lightning photos with this lens and it is absolutely amazing. Um, fourth one that I recommend 
and this is for full frame bodies only. Um, that would be the Laua or Venus 15 millimeter F point F 2.0. Sorry about that. Um, the Laua is a very well built lens, completely um, water sealed with rubber on it, um, on the front element and the rear element only. It is a relatively cheap option. Um, when you compare it to some of the other ones on here, it generally runs between five and 650 for that lens. Um, it's also a very good lens for astrophotography with the low aperture on it. In fact, it's one of the best wide angle lenses that you can use for astrophotography. Um, but you can also stop it down so that you're shooting at like f5.6 and it works real, really, really well for general storm photography as well. And then the last one on here is the 15 millimeter Iris, Irix Blackstone. Um, it's an f2.4. This is a much more expensive option. Generally, it tends to run between $1,200 and $1,400, depending on which mount you get it with. Um, what I love about this lens, I do not have it in my bag, but I have tested it two different times now. It is a completely sealed lens. And when I say completely sealed, this thing has rubber all over the place on it to prevent water from even touching any part of the inside of the lens. It has front and back element <coughs> O-rings on it. Sorry about that. Uh, front and back O-rings, as well as O-rings around each of the optical elements and also around the gear controls on the exterior of the camera. It also has a uh, second layer on the inside of the lens that prevents water from getting inside of it. So it's a very, very waterproof lens. It's probably the most waterproof lens that is out there for storm photography. Like I said, I carry a couple other lenses with me. Um, the one that I find myself carrying more and more here recently is my 200 to 600, um, latest release from Sony. Use it a lot for birding, but it also comes in extremely handy when there is a tornado on the ground and you don't wanna get too close to it. You can pull that lens out, get great detailed shots of a tornado from, I would say the furthest away that I've gotten good detail shots, would be about 20 miles. Um, it does a really good job of long distance uh, tornado photography. If you don't have something in that range, um, even the 75 to 300 range does a really good job with uh, longer distances up to about 10 miles um, away from storms or tornadoes. Um, I had my son with me last year on his birthday or the Iowa City tornado, and he actually got a really good close-up shot from about eight miles away of a tornado on the ground just to the southwest of Iowa City. I was shooting a time lapse with my wide angle, told him to zoom in on the tornado. He got a great photo of it. He actually has a better photo than I ever got of any part of that storm, just because he pulled out a 75 to 300 and shot with that. Checking to see if there's any questions. Does not look like I have any right now. Are there any? I'll give you about 30 seconds. And if not, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide. It doesn't look like anything popped up, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, some of the other gear that's essential for storm photography, sturdy tripod and weights, um, heavy duty tripods work the best, but almost any tripod will do except for the extremely lightweight ones. Um, the weight bags add stability in the wind. This is a big deal. Um, as far as getting really crisp, clear photos are concerned, 
if you're shooting a storm that has anything over about 15 mile an hour winds, you want to put a little bit of weight on your tripod. That way it doesn't move around in the winds. Um, I carry about 40 to 50 pounds with me at all times, just in case I need it uh, in weight bags. One of the keys for me um, with storm photography, as far as gear is concerned, is a window mounted ball head. That would be this one right here. That is something that clamps onto your window. Um, it can be any window that rolls down or up in your vehicle. Um, doesn't matter where it's at. If it goes up and down and you can fit your camera in it, you can mount that. What that allows you to do is take photos from the safety of your vehicle. Say there's a whole bunch of lightning around, you don't want to get out of the vehicle. You can clamp that to the window, use your trigger, which we're going to cover here in just a second, and trigger it from across the vehicle. Or if that's too much for you, you can use your if your phone or if your camera has the capability, you can use your phone to trigger it. That way you don't have a direct connection to the camera. Um, I have four different styles of these and I have found that the ball head type tends to work the best for locking in place uh, in a vehicle. Um, the third thing I recommend, and I covered this a little bit earlier, is a shutter release or intervalometer. Um, that would be this right here. It, the one I'm showing right here is an intervalometer and shutter release combination. It requires two AAA batteries and you can get them for like 10 bucks. Most of your camera stores will carry them and you can also buy them online. Um, the other options that you have are mechanical wired releases um, for some of the film photographers. Those work very, very well for all aspects of storm photography. And also they have electronic, just shutter releases with a lock on them. Those work really well. Um, I covered a little bit earlier, uh, intervalometers. It can be an internal one on the camera or an external one like this one here. And the last option is via phone app. Um, I think all of the major uh, brands of cameras now have at least two or three models out that allow for phone app control of your camera. If you want absolutely no shake at all introduced, that's probably your best option. The problem with that is it does not allow you to lock the shutter in place. So if you wanted to shoot continuous exposure for lightning, you can't really do that with the phone app. That's the only downfall to that. Last thing I take with me when I'm out and about is an inverter. Um, ACDC, uh, this is for keeping batteries charged and other gear, like my video camera batteries, my video cameras themselves, some of them run off of DC plugins. So I have to have them plugged in at all times. Um, it's a great thing to have in your vehicle, even if you don't go out and chase, just so that you have an option for charging that isn't directly into um, the AC inverter. Um, the one that I have costs about $45. The one that's pictured here runs about $112. But Walmart even has a couple of options for like, I think it's $13 or $14. That are really good plug-in options. Um, the downfall to the cheaper ones is they do not have fuses on them. So that if you were to overload the circuit, and you're just blowing the entire unit. Um, some of these larger units come with three or four fuses on them. So it's just a quick change of a fuse and you're off and running again. As far as camera settings go, I generally shoot in three different modes. Um, that would be what I call the general storm modes. Um, it's not necessarily modes on a camera, but the modes that I am in as far as what I'm thinking when I'm taking the photo. 
Um, that would be daytime mode, mostly sunny skies with a few clouds, um, backlit situations, um, backside of the storm situations, all of those are fall into that. Um, the next mode is sunset mode, which is your higher contrast scenes and also for actual sunset photos, um, both looking to and away from the storm and then nighttime mode, which is a completely different frame of mind uh, when you're taking photos of storms at night and then also with lightning. Um, for the daytime, I generally shoot ISO as low as I possibly can. General rule of thumb um, is between 50 on my camera or the lowest that you can go and up to around 1600. Um, I try to keep the F stop during the day between 4.5 and 9. That gives you the greatest detail as far as your depth of field is concerned and also allows for easy adjustments with contrast. Say if it gets sunnier, you just take your f-stop up just a little bit. Um, the other thing that can change your f-stop is if you're using any filters, like I mentioned earlier, um, you use a filter, you generally tend to use a slightly higher f-stop so that you get a little bit more sharpness and depth of field in the photo. Uh, my ideal f-stop, for the wide angle photos that you've been seeing here and for generally almost all storm photography is right around a 6.3. Um, that's kind of the magic spot for the wide angle lenses as far as depth of field is concerned. Uh, I do adjust from there and you'll kind of see that. Uh, it all depends on the situation. Just play around, find what works best with the gear that you have. These are just general settings, it's not specific to any lens or any camera body, but it's just what I found from playing around with different types of lens and body combinations. Um, the photo that you see above here, up in this area, up here with rainbow is ISO 200 at 4.5 and 1 25 hundredth of a second. Um, the reason that this photo has such a fast shutter speed on it, it was moving away from me at almost 60 miles an hour, and I wanted to get good contrast on the ra uh, rainbow. There's actually two rainbows if you look really, really closely. Up above, right in this general area, there is a second rainbow there, but it was fading quickly. I almost missed it completely. When you're shooting rainbow type of photos, the quicker your shutter speed is, the more detail you will end up getting in the raw file. Um, something that I played around with for probably six years before I completely figured out the best and optimal settings for rainbows. Um, the key with rainbows is the F4.5 five and a quick shutter speed and then you adjust your ISO wherever it needs to be for the best exposure. Uh, look to see if there's any questions. Doesn't look like there is so I'm going to go ahead and move on. Whoops, I need to go back. There we go. Jumped ahead a little bit on myself there. For uh, darker skies during the daytime, it's very similar to what you shoot during the day, um, but sometimes you have a little bit higher ISO and a little bit lower f-stop. The reason for that being the higher ISO allows you to expose your foreground properly and the lower f-stop, which means a higher number, allows you to get more detail in the clouds, which is kind of what you're seeing off to the right-hand side here. Um, Generally, the higher contrast it is with the skies, the higher I will go with that f-stop number. So this one is probably medium contrast, so I only went from f2.8 to f3.5 on this one. Um, you probably could have gone up as far as 5.6 on this and still had pretty good contrast on it. 
but you go up to like F9 and you'll actually start to lose a little bit of the cloud detail because there's too much contrast in the photo. Um, the photo behind this right here is ISO 50 F35 at one one hundredth of a second. The reason that I chose one one hundredth of a second on this particular photo is I wanted to capture the storm as a whole, but I also wanted to capture just a little tiny bit of movement in the clouds. Um, this is from the time lapse that I took last year in Iowa City. And if you look down here, on this side of the storm, you can kind of see that the very edges of the clouds have just a little bit of motion blur in them. That's the direction that the storm is moving. And when I was putting this time lapse, planning this time lapse in my head, I wanted to get a general idea of the storm movement just by looking at a single photo. This also makes the time lapse transitions a little bit smoother. They don't look quite as jumpy. So that's why I went with the one one hundredth. Normally, I would shoot a scene like this at about one two fiftieth, all the way up to one one thousandth of a second. Sunset photos with storms. Um, these are tricky. Uh, probably the trickiest of any of the photos that you will you will attempt, um, especially from the front side of a storm. Sunset photos with storms. I tend to shoot it between ISO 50 and ISO 3200. Um, main reason I go all the way up to 3200 is to capture just a little bit more light detail in, say, like the shelf area of this cloud where there's a little bit of blue poking through. That would be your slightly higher ISO normally. Um, I tend to shoot short, slower shutter speeds uh, between one tenth and one one hundredth of a second for the later storms. And that's basically just out of necessity. There's less light, you're going to have to use a slower shutter in order to expose properly. Um, <clears throat> the other reason that you have a slightly slower shutter speed, you generally tend to shoot higher f-stops because of a high contrast situation. Um, there's a lot of detail that can be missed right around sunset if you do not slightly overexpose and take your uh, f-stop up to between f9 and f8, f18. The other thing that it does is it adds a whole bunch of depth of field. Um, in this particular shot, you can see that everything is in focus all the way from my foreground to the very tip of the shelf cloud in the background there. That's what your F9 to F11 range is absolutely optimal for your late afternoon depth of field. It gives you incredible detail throughout the photo. Um, the other thing that it allows for is a little bit of contrast, what I call contrast control. You'll end up with areas up at the top of the photo that are slightly overexposed. You can pull those down a lot easier if you're at a slightly higher f-stop without completely losing the rest of the photo. And it also allows for spot adjustments to those areas so that you can take them down individually without making it look photoshopped or faked. Um, everybody in here knows that pretty much everybody uses Photoshop anymore, at least for little details. That's one of the tips and tricks uh, is to use local brushes to take down your highlights or increase your shadows just a little tiny bit. In this particular photo, I did not have to do that. I The raw file was good enough that I was able to take it down without any local adjustments. And I was able to pull quite a bit of color out of this exposure um, as far as my blues and greens were concerned. I didn't get quite as much orange um, as I wanted on it, but I'm okay with that because the rest of the photo looked really, really good. Um, this photo was taken at approximately 20 minutes before an actual sunset. 
So it was actually very, very dark when this exposure was taken. I just used the available light to light the foreground and then it got the exposure right on the shelf cloud itself. Um, this photo is ISO 50 at F11 and one sixth of a second. Um, this can vary greatly if you are shooting the backside of a storm, and I kind of covered that a little bit earlier. You'll have a much faster shutter speed on the backside of a storm at sunset than you will on the front side of a storm. The other thing that you run into is you get a lot of reflecting light on the backside. On the front side, most of the light is filtered down through the cloud. But the filtering down through the cloud allows for the great colors that you see in this photo. Um, when you are taking photographs of a sunset from the backside of a storm, um, generally you don't really want to go any higher than F11. You will run into contrast issues. Um, it will actually be over contrasted. And you'll want to shoot generally between ISO as low as you can go and ISO 800. You generally won't have to go any higher than that. Um, I do occasionally just do regular sun, sunset shots, and generally I tend to keep my shutter speed at around 1 250th of a second for those that has the best color um, in those photos. And that's just from experimenting. Um, you go too much faster than that, you tend to lose a little bit of your saturation. You go any slower than that, you end up with cloud blur. So if you like cloud blur, blur then you slow your shutter down just a little tiny bit. Looking to see if there's any questions. It doesn't look like there is. All right, camera settings for lightning at night. Um, this is my main area of interest when it comes to storm photography and probably the area that I have the most photos of when it comes to storms. Um, basically any storm that is within 50 miles of me and it has lightning, I'm generally trying to get photos of it. Um, when you're shooting lightning at, at night, you need to be as low as possible on your ISO. So as a general rule, I shoot between, uh, for me, ISO 50, which is as low as my camera will go, all the way up to ISO 400. Um, general rule of thumb is if it's further away, I'll be closer to 400. If it's super close range, I'll be much closer to 50 or at 50 for my ISO. Your aperture will be wide open with the except, there's one exception to that. Um, you want it on the lowest number that it can go. So you're letting in as much light as possible. You're shooting in a dark situation. So the more light that you let in, generally the better the results tend to be. Um, for me, that's either 2.8 or 3.5, depending on which lens that I'm using at the time. And occasionally i will jump it up to f4 as well on the low end but that's for really 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 strong lightning that's far away um, the one exception to that rule is when lightning is extremely close or extremely intense um, when i'm shooting in my car and i have lightning bolts that are like five to six miles away or closer I will go up to F11. The reason that I go up to F11, it, it makes, when you're shooting with a wide angle, it gives you an increased depth of field. Normally when I'm taking lighting, lightning photos that close, I'm shooting up in the sky and I'm trying to capture lightning that is hitting the ground just barely and then coming up and over or branching out. Um, the F11 allows those closer bolts to not overexpose. Um, the shot that you're looking at behind me is kind of an example of an oopsie on my part, and I'll get to that in just a second. Your shutter speeds when uh, photographing lightning will be between 3 and 30 seconds. Um, I don't recommend anything less than 3 seconds, and I do not recommend bulb mode for lightning photography. Most people that have searched around recommend, they find recommend, recommendations for the bulb setting. Bulb setting does not allow you to control 
your exposure properly. And that's why I don't like it. You're just kind of guessing with bull mode. And less guesswork there is, in my opinion, with an exposure, the better off you're going to be. Um, so the shutter speed will vary depending on frequency of lightning and intensity, as well as distance. Um, so as an example, if lightning is 15 miles away, at medium intensity, and I'm only getting one or two bolts every minute, I will probably be, be closer to the 30 second range. That way I'm letting more light and more storm detail into the photo. Um, if the lightning is, let's say three, four to five seconds, uh, I would say strong intensity and less than a mile away, I'd probably be at about five seconds, maybe four. It kind of depends. Um, and I would also be closing the aperture to F11. Um, just it's one of those things you kind of have to play around with and see what works for you. Um, the photo that's behind here is uh, ISO 50 F56, and that's my oopsie on this photo is F56, and it was 10 seconds. The reason that this photo is actually an oopsie at 56 is that this little section in the upper right hand corner, right in here. It is all overexposed in the raw file. Um, when I say overexposed, I had to drop the exposure on this almost four stops in order to recover enough data to get the light bolt itself to drop far enough that I could see the detail of the bolt. If I would have been shooting at F11, I probably wouldn't have had to adjust the exposure at all. So that's my oopsie on this photo. As far as daytime lightning is concerned, it is generally close to the same settings that you see here. Um, when I say generally, it might be a little bit faster shutter times and you will be shooting almost continuously during the day um, as opposed to always continuously at night. During the day, lightning is probably about a 10% chance of you actually capturing it on camera. Number one, daytime storms don't tend to have as much lightning as nighttime storms unless they are extremely intense. That's the first reason you won't get much daytime lightning. Um, the second reason is that when there is daytime lightning and is normally in a section of the storm that is well lit by the sun, that's usually the strongest part of the storm and it is extremely difficult to get your contrast even with good ND filters in that section of the storm to expose properly because you're dealing with way too much light coming in. The best place to get daytime lightning photos um, as far as storms are concerned is in the western section of a supercell or in the northern section of a shelf cloud. Um, those tend to be the darkest areas and it's the easiest spot to get lightning. They also tend to be the most active as far as hail is concerned. So it's one of those one of those things you're gonna have to get your lightning photos and then get out of the way so that you don't get hit by hail. Go ahead and move on to the next one. Editing lightning. Um, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of detail on this. I'm just going to cover a couple of general things. And then on the PowerPoint that I linked you guys to on my Dropbox, you can click on the link on here. And he has a full, it's about an hour long video. Uh, it's a complete walkthrough on how to do lightning stacking. Um, kind of covers every possible uh, aspect that you could think of with the exception of maybe two or three daytime situations with photo or with lightning stacking. Um, if you can keep your tripod in the exact same location for lightning, you can stack photos. Um, this allows for multiple strikes to be added to the same frame. Um, 
like I said, my good buddy, Jason Wangard, he is a fellow storm chaser from Texas. He has a full tutorial on it on his web page. Um, generally, what I tend to do when I'm stacking lightning photos, and this is just a general overview, is I will layer them. So I put each different photo in a layer. I will use the lighten mode uh, in Photoshop. When I bring them into the different layers, I will leave the bottom layer untouched and then select the rest of the photos. Go up to the option, you'll have the darken, multiply, lighten. There's like 14 other options in there. I generally tend to use lighten uh, for my lightning stacking. The reason being, the lightning is the brightest part of the exposure. It will pop forward. Occasionally, you will get little issues on your photos. Um, this particular photo is one of my first, and I'm gonna show you an error that I made on it. Um, you'll get little errors like what you see right in here, or a rogue bolt will come through, and it doesn't really match the rest of the scene. In that case, I did mask uh, the individual layers on this photo, but I missed that when I was going through. That was something I probably should have caught, but didn't. Um, like I said, I mask each individual layer so that the lightning and the light of the photo look uniform. In this particular photo, like I said, the only area that I messed up on was that everything else is relatively uniform and it followed along with where the storm went. So it, the storm moved from left to right as you're looking at the photo and increased in intensity when it was about a mile and a half away from me. Um, this particular photo was taken in an area just to the northwest of Cedar Rapids in very early to no this was in mid-June 2016 um, and my favorite aspect of this is the amount of lightning bugs that you see in the foreground it was absolutely insane how many lightning bugs there were in that Looking to see if there are any questions. It does not look like there are. So I'm going to move on. One of the last things that I'm going to cover here, I believe this is the second or third to last slide. Um, editing time lapses. Time-lapse photography is pretty much the same as any other um, time-lapse that you do when you're doing storms. Um, you'll want to get the shots as close together as possible uh, to reduce any flicker when you're putting the video together. Um, I've got a tutorial that I've linked um, in the PowerPoint presentation when you uh, download it and they'll walk you through that. Um, basically, there are two different options that you have. You have the option of keeping the camera in one place and letting the storm move through the frame. You have the option of moving the camera to match the movement of the storm. So you're getting the same section the entire way through, or you can do what is called sliders and pivoters. Um, they're automated machines that you can mount to your tripod and or tripods if you have multiples that you can actually pan, tilt, and move left and right and get really unique effects. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of this one um, here. This is an award-winning time-lapse uh, sequ sequence. It's actually about 40 to 50 different time lapses that my friend Mike Uplinski did over a five year span out in Kansas, Nebraska, and Northern Oklahoma. And he has just about every type of weather in time lapse in this little video. Thank 
I'll go ahead and stop it there. If you want to view the rest of it, just click on it when you download the PowerPoint presentation. It's an absolutely gorgeous sequence. And the way that he put it together and the music that he used was incredible as well. Um, the one thing that I didn't cover before I started that, uh, when you're shooting time lapse for SORMs, you want to be an aperture priority. Main reason for this, you want your aperture to be steady. You want to have the depth of field throughout the entire thing. And then you wanna let the camera do the math for the rest of the exposure. Um, so I generally tend to shoot my time-lapse sequences between five, six and F11. And that is to get the depth of field that I want depending on where the storm is and how far away it is. Um, further away it is, the larger the number is for the depth of field or for the aperture. Um, just a general rule. All right, I will now open it up for a question and answer session. I'm going to give it about 10 minutes. That'll put us right around the eight o'clock time frame. A um, couple of things that uh, Laura asked me to kind of cover here. Uh, I am going to be doing a drawing. Uh, I'm gonna take everybody's email addresses that attended this meeting. I'm gonna put it in a drawing and I'm going to choose um, one person that if they would like to go on a chase with me, either at some point later this year, uh, once the virus has kind of settled down a little bit, I will give you that option. Or if that isn't an option, it will might possibly be next year. Um, if you do not want to be included in that drawing, please let Laura know via email or message. Um, that way, if you don't want to do it, you're not even included in the drawing. Um, like I said early in the presentation, if there isn't enough time or if you think of something afterwards and you want to ask another question, please feel free to email me. Um, I've got my email address up on the screen right now. Um, it's P Brooks photography, all lowercase, at gmail.com. Um, I'm actually going to copy that and paste it. Again, in the chat so that everybody can see it. Um, um, and if you think of something afterwards that you want to ask me, please feel free to email. I am totally up to answering questions. Um, if there's more in-depth editing knowledge that you would like to go through, I can try to schedule something. Um, it's a lot easier to explain editing um, in either a one-on-one -on -one session or a face-to-face -face session, which really isn't an option right now, but I can do one-on-one -on -one sessions with individuals try to walk you through how I do some of the editing that I do. Um, like I said, everybody edits a little bit different, so I didn't want to get into a whole bunch of detail with that. But um, I do have 
it looks like another Paul that has asked multiple exposures or exposures on the same frame. I shoot lightning in separate exposures. So I am doing continuous shots and then I go back and pull out the shots that have lightning in them and stack them into a single photo using Photoshop. Um, when you're doing that, you need to have uh, the tripod completely isolated. Uh, any slight movement at all will make any photo after that movement in a slightly different location. And then you run into really weird um, aberrations when you go to edit or stack them together to where your foregrounds don't line up. It makes it very, very difficult to stack. Um, there are some little cheats in Photoshop now that allow you to adjust your foreground so that the elements match up. The problem with doing that, especially with a wide angle lens, is you will end up with a little bit of anamorphic distortion. So your parts won't completely line up because of what we call a lens bend, uh, where your outside corners of the lens, they bend out no matter how well you correct it in either Lightroom or whatever program you're using. Doesn't matter how well you correct it, there's still a little bit of bend at the outside edges. Uh, Jacqueline was asking if I have a website. I do have a website. I don't have a whole bunch of my images on my actual website right now. Um, what I can do, I can pull up my sales site, which has a whole bunch of my images on it, but that, but that is different than my actual website. Give me just a second to pull that up. And I'm going to type this in up top. That is my sales site that I just posted up there and my actual website I'm going to put up there as well. Laura, you are very correct about the radar. I was looking at that before I started the presentation. Um, there is lightning off to the south and slight west of us. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull up one of the websites that I recommended full screen so you guys can see it. Um, I'm going to bring up the lightning tracker that I mentioned. And I'm going to bring that into the full screen. So. Give me just a second. All right, this is the website I was talking about earlier. This is lightningmaps.org. Um, this is the one that tracks in real time where lightning is in the entire world. Um, 
zooming in a little bit more towards the Davenport Quad Cities area. And if you look off to our southwest, there is a little bit of lightning down that direction. Doesn't look like it's striking very frequently right now. Um, the darker the dots are, the older the lightning strike is. So it's actually been a little while since there was a lightning strike down there. But these storms do tend to pulse off and on. So you never know when it's going to pop back up. I'm also going to pull up the radar on my phone real quick and give it a peek. It does not look like there is any lightning with that cell that is just off to the south of me. And Laura, I was fancy, but I did a good job of not looking at my phone or anything while I was doing this. So I actually wasn't sure of how close it actually was. All right. Uh, Jacqueline, uh, you are very welcome. Um, the other Paul asked, have you ever used a fixed camera position on top of a structure and control the camera from the ground? Um, say like an 85 foot grain bin, for example. Um, no, I have not used any remote tools. Um, I have attempted drone shots of lightning, not very fun and extremely dangerous. Um, I was actually very stupid about the time that I tried it and actually put myself in a position that I should not have been. If you do have the technology, say uh, security cameras that you have mounted, they do have the availability of doing longer exposures for that type of thing. So if you did have something on top of a grain bin, you could do that. The problem is you're using a CMOS sensor and CMOS sensors are notorious for introducing noise. So there'll probably be a lot of uh, post work to edit those photos. It's a very good question. You actually made me think on that one. Are there any other questions, comments, anything else? Give it another two to three minutes, and then I'm gonna go ahead and close this out, and that will be the end of this. Um, I will have a link probably within the next 24 to 48 hours um, that I will be sending to Laura. I recorded this entire session, and I will be posting it on YouTube. So if you would like to go back over the session or just refer friends to it, it would be greatly appreciated. It's going to be on my YouTube channel. Um, Paul just asked uh, about lightning triggers. I have friends that use them. They work very well for trying to capture daytime lightning strikes. Um, at night, you really don't need them. Um, you're better off just shooting back-to-back -back exposures um, as long as your memory card is fast enough, you should be able to shoot continuously all night long um, exposure wise on any of the newer cameras. So you don't really need a lightning trigger at night, but for daytime, yes. Daytime lightning triggers work extremely well. A um, couple of the ones that I recommend, um, MyOps has a very good trigger and also Arsenal, um, one of the newer entries into the game their sensor is probably the most sensitive sensor as far as lightning is concerned. Uh, problem is the lightning sensor for that is quite a bit more expensive. It's an add-on to the original product. Um, there are some cheaper options, but they tend not to work as well as far as sensing lightning. I believe Camera Corner does have one or two options up there as well.
while the the last questions are coming in, Paul, I just want to say thank you so very much for all of the work that you put in to make this possible on the internet. I know it's a new venture for you and um, we greatly appreciate being the role models for you. So um, thank you very much and thank you for all the time of putting this together. Uh, fantastic pre presentation and um, everything worked wonderful. So um, thank you very much again and um, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. So. Um, I see some, you know, quite a few thank yous coming in. So that's, that's great. Um, loved having you and uh, maybe we'll do another, another uh, venture like this again sometime. So appreciate it. That sounds good. I'm going to start trying to put together a couple more presentations, at least till this little episode is over. That way I can kind of keep myself busy and also hopefully spread a little bit of the knowledge that I do have. It may not be much, but I do have a little bit of it. So now yeah, this is this is great. It's um well, we've I think everybody enjoyed it and it looks like and um lots of awesome information and we look forward to getting out there and, and doing some of it. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. All righty. Everybody have a good night and thank you. Good night. See you guys all later. Bye.